Welcome to First Baptist Church Statesboro. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. My name is Robbie Norman. I serve as discipleship pastor. And if you're visiting, we would love the chance to connect with you. And the best way to do that is for you to take your device, scan the QR code that you see on the screen or in the pew in front of you. Before we get started with our worship service today, here are some announcements that we want you to be aware of. Our women's ministry is holding their fall kickoff event on Sunday, August 27th, right here at church in the Perry Fellowship Hall. All women are encouraged to attend, to get to know one another, to see our women's ministry leadership, and to hear about the plans that our women's ministry has moving forward for this next church year. College students, we invite you to join us for a college night of worship and prayer on Sunday, August 31st at 7 o'clock p.m., right here in the Worship Center at First Baptist Church. Now, this is going to include not just First Baptist Church, but community-wide churches and campus ministries for Georgia Southern. So we want you to make plans to be here on August 31st for the College Night of Prayer. We're excited that Midweek on Main returns in full force this Wednesday, August 16th. After the service today, we invite you to go by the Next Steps area to look at the different adult class options that are available and to sign up for one that best suits your spiritual need. On Midweek on Main this Wednesday night, everything comes back. Student ministry, children's ministry, college ministry, adult ministry, worship ministry, and family night supper. It all starts at 5 o'clock p.m. So come get your midweek spiritual boost here at First Baptist and Midweek on Main. We are glad that you're here. Now let's start our worship service with Dr. John Waters, our lead pastor. Hey, it is great to have all you here this morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church Statesboro, whether you're here in the room with us or joining us through our live stream ministry. So wherever you are on part of this media ministry, thank you for joining our live stream and we hope you track along through the whole service and uh, thank you for being a part of that. Our goal as a church is to help you either to start or to strengthen your relationship with Jesus. What that means is we're all on the journey together. We might be in different pace, places, moving at different speeds, but we're all pointed toward Jesus. So we want to help you. That's the reason we have the events and activities we have is we want to help you on that spiritual journey, whatever the shape and size of your family might happen to be. Today we're celebrating College Day. And so if you're one of our college students uh, from the area, thank you for being here. We greeted some at the 830 service. Glad you're here. Or you might be part of the family members. So a lot of the college students were moving in uh, this week. And so whether your mom or dad, family member, college students, thank you for being here today. And this church has a long, wonderful heritage of loving and using and welcoming college students. We're glad you're here. And, um, you know, during the fall, there's always the time, the football season. And, you know, get get it down there, Paul's in stadium, and we cheer for the Georgia Southern Eagles. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I love at the start of the game, we do that whose house, our house thing. Why don't we try that today? (laughs) Whose house? (laughs) Whose house? Wait a minute, though. This is the Lord's house. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, that's the name of our first song. It's the house of the Lord. So with the same enthusiasm, let's stand and sing, Welcome to the house of the Lord. Good morning, church. Psalms 13, 6 says, I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. If the Lord has been good to you, then let's sing together about the joy in the house of the Lord.
satisfy my soul like you Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do Who could ever be more faithful to I will trust in you I will trust Thank you to Jeff Brazel, our worship pastor, our music team uh, leading us as we worship the Lord today. Remember, the Lord is the audience this morning, and we 
trust and pray that He takes delight in the way we worship Him this morning. On this College Day emphasis at First Baptist Church Statesboro, I wanted to introduce our college pastor, Drew Feltz. Many of you know him or met him this morning, but we want to make sure you know who he is. He's the guy with the great looking hair compared to the rest of us. But Drew has been our college pastor for three years this fall, and uh, several years ago we had a lot of a, a big congregational gathering, and one of the big priorities they said, we need to prioritize and revitalize our college ministry. And one of those steps was bringing Drew Feltz here as our college pastor. His dear wife Angela is seated here on the front row. And, and so they came here three years ago with their little infant daughter. And now three years later, um, their daughter has grown up quite a bit. And they're now they're expecting their first son. So congratulations to Drew and Angela. Fantastic. And so Drew, give us a good word about college ministry and how the Lord's leading you here today. Thanks, John. Welcome everyone, particularly if you're a college student, I hope you feel welcomed here. And uh, we just want you to know our college ministry and our church loves college students. And we want to equip you guys. Y'all are not here that long. That's the reality of it. So as you guys come into Statesboro and come into our church, I want to encourage you to lean in and to not just attend, but to take that next step and to get involved because God's got some amazing things for all of you guys. He's going to send you all all over the place. And we hope that we can equip you guys to be disciples of Jesus and followers. And I know it can be a little intimidating at times to make we take that next step in a bigger church and stuff, but I promise you it is worth it. And I can tell you story after story, but I think better it would be to have some of our college students tell you about getting involved here and how it's changed them. So let's watch this video real quick about some of our college students. Hey, my name is Grace Kennedy. I am a senior here at Georgia Southern University as a finance major, and I have been a part of First Baptist Church for about eight years now. So my mom and I were looking for something new within a church and we wanted to find a community of believers that were um, encouraging to us in our personal walk of faith and people that would also push us outward and that is exactly what we found in First Baptist. One way I wanted to get involved with the church is through missions. Missions is something I've always been very passionate about and involved in ever since middle school and throughout my high school career. Drew brought up the opportunity of me spending my summer in France serving on mission, and I was definitely hesitant at first, but it wasn't until one weekend I could not get that thought out of my head. Of course, that same weekend on that Sunday morning, I was watching the live stream, and John Waters brings up the exact same opportunity during the service. I knew in that moment the Lord was leading me to spend my summer in France. This experience has grown my walk with the Lord in more ways than I can count. I was pushed out of my comfort zone and I saw firsthand the need of the gospel among other nations and religions. I encourage other college students to take that step of faith into obedience to go forth and make disciples of all the nations. Hey FBC, my name is Parker Satterwhite and I'm a senior here at Georgia Southern studying mechanical engineering. I started attending FBC as a freshman in college. From the moment I first walked in, I felt welcomed and wanted. I knew that this was the place I wanted to get involved and connect in. Growing up, I served in different production ministries um, at some of the churches I went to. I knew that the production ministry here at FBC was something I wanted to get involved in. So one day after the service, I went and talked to the production manager and got plugged in and connected. In getting involved here at the church, I've gotten to build so many really good relationships. In these relationships, I've not only gained practical knowledge in production and ministry, I've also seen how to serve in a Christ-like manner through these ministries. In this ministry, I've gotten to build relationships with my peers that grow me spiritually by investing in them and by them investing in me. I know that these relationships that I've built along the way have changed and impacted my college experience, and I know that they will continue to grow and develop even after my college career is over. That's one thing I love about FEC, the emphasis on discipleship and how discipleship grows relationships to grow us closer to Jesus. Well, my name is Reese Hancock, um, and I am a mechanical engineering major at Georgia Southern University. So the first time that I was here, um, I knew this was gonna be a great place. Um, th this was definitely an answer to my prayers. And the next Sunday I came, it was just the same. And then just one thing led to another. And um, I just started making more connections and more friendships. And it was just evident that this was the place I needed to be. Uh, so back in February, I think it was February, I made the decision to, to join here, and it's been, it's been great. So growing up, I've always had a very strong passion for music. Um, and as I've gotten older, you know, I've um, even come to appreciate um, worshiping through music also. Um, and it took me a little while, but 
Um, one Sunday, I um, just sat down on a limb and talked to Jeff, and one thing led to another, and there I was on my first Sunday playing the keys here at First Baptist. And uh, pretty nerve-wracking, I have to say. Another reason that I decided to, um, to join and to get involved was to let other people know that it is okay to step out of your comfort zone and to do things that you're not comfortable with because in the end, uh, the result can be very rewarding uh, for, for not only yourself, but for other people. The amount of relationships and connections and friendships that I've made with the people here at First Baptist have, have made me healthier as a person and also just really strengthened my relationship with God. Well, yes, certainly so. Since uh, its founding, uh, what we call Georgia Southern University over a hundred years ago, uh, this church has had a heartbeat for students. So we, college students are welcomed and wanted here. And we want to take a moment to pray for you. We're going to feed you after uh, the service today, uh, downstairs in our pair fellowship hall, which is down on level one. Many of you met down there during the uh, hour before this one, but all of our college students and families, you're welcome to come join us for the lunch. We want to host in your honor today. But let's pray for you today and pray for you in this college ministry. Father, we thank you that for many, many years you have been using First Baptist Church Statesboro to impact the lives of college students. So I pray as the new semester begins uh, this season that you're already working in the lives of many students, uh, many who are seated in this place right now, others that will come in the coming weeks. I pray for Drew as he leads out with our adult volunteers and our student key leaders and him and Angela. Thank you that you brought him to First Baptist Church Statesboro several years ago. Continue to use him. And I pray we as a church which serve students, give them a place uh, where they can serve. May this be a place where they can love and be loved, a place where they can be cared for and counted on. And may you encourage them on this special day and in the semester that stretches out before us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You look around the world today, you don't have to look very far or search very long to see all kinds of problems and difficulties, and often you wonder, where's the goodness of God in all that? Well, what we do by faith is even though the world at times seems to be spiraling out of control, we can see reminders of God's presence, His providence, his grace and his care. We can see evidences of his goodness and his everlasting love. This next song our choir is going to share for us is entitled Evidence. It talks about the evidence. You look around, you can see, even in a world that's gone crazy, evidences of God's grace and his kindness to you. Harley is going to be leading out on this song. He and his wife Bailey are in the process of becoming church members here. And uh, I know you'll be encouraged as Harley leads and our choir sings about the evidences of God's goodness.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. this chorus together this morning. Jesus, 
Thank you, Jeff, and thank all of y'all for worshiping the Lord, singing so well, and uh, we do pray that uh, as part of being a part of the service encourages you, whether it's your first time attending here, you're one of our longtime members. That's why we gather. Believers gather together for worship. That's, that's one of the marks of the New Testament of how we say we're followers of Jesus. We gather with brothers and sisters, so it's been wonderful doing that today. This morning, I want to preach a message out of the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. And I invite you to take the listening guide I hope you found when you picked up a bulletin or one was given to you. And you can take some notes on that and share those. Uh, we're taking three weeks. We started last week and we go today and next week looking at six changes that Jesus makes in your life under the theme that Jesus changes everything. If you're going to follow Jesus, uh, there's nothing His grace and love, nothing that it doesn't touch, nothing that it doesn't change. And so our theme verse is out of the New Testament book, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we have two books in our Bible with the name Corinthians, the 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Uh, but we know from what Paul wrote in these letters that he, he exchanged multiple letters with them. And it was an ongoing dialogue that academics call the Corinthian correspondence. But by God's grace and His divine wisdom, only two of those letters are included in our Bible, 1 and 2 Corinthians. But let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where we have the former Pharisee, who used to be called Saul of Tarsus, who had a radical change in his life, and now we call him Paul the Apostle, talking about the change that took place and the change that always takes place when you give your life to Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
This is from a man who lived it, breathed it, experienced it. The change that he's talking about, he didn't read about in a book. He walked that pathway. His own life had changed, and he's encouraging and reminding believers that Jesus does. He changes everything. The challenge we face in a lot of churches these days, somebody once said, is they come to church just as they are, they sing just as I am, and they leave just as they were. (laughs) And not many folks are experiencing the radical change that comes from following Jesus. And so if you're going to follow Jesus, understand He's not interested in giving you information. He wants you to experience transformation. And isn't the Christian faith more than just a bunch of facts and figures in your head? Isn't following Jesus more than a bunch of outward religious ceremonies? That there needs to be an inside out transformation that Jesus begins to change everything about you. Surely that's what Christian faith is all about. It's not about knowledge. It's not about information. It's about a life changing transformation when you follow Jesus Christ. And when you do, as witnessed by the words of this former Pharisee named Paul the Apostle, Jesus changes everything. Here's the main thing to know over these three weeks as we consider this idea of the change that Jesus makes. Simply stated, if Jesus changes anything, He changes everything. We need to get it out of our head that somehow Jesus will take a kind of a treetop survey view of our life and He'll cherry pick four or five things He wants to change. Oh no! Jesus takes us, turns us inside out, right side out, upside down. He changes everything in our life, our our marriage, our finances, our priorities, our loves, our connections, our friendships. If Jesus changes anything, He changes everything. So over this three-week period, I'm talking about six significant changes that Jesus brings. The first two I did last week, and the final two I'll do next week. But let's focus on the middle two for this week. Now, we began the list last week saying Jesus changes who I am. He changes our heart, gives us a new identity, who we are. You are not who the, the, you think you are. You, you're not who you say you are. You're not who the devil says you are. You're not who your parents say you are. You are who Jesus says you are. He changes who I am, gives me a brand new heart and a brand new start. We also learned last week the second change is that He changes what I live for. Once He gives you a new identity, He gives you a new purpose. He gives you a new why, why you live and what you live for. This morning we go to change number three, and that's Jesus changes how I think. Once He changes who I am and changes what I'm living for, He's also changing how I think as well. When the Apostle Paul talked about the old being gone and the brand new comes, he wasn't just talking about external behavior and ceremonies. It was an inside out kind of change. That's the transformation that comes from Jesus Christ. And because he gives you a a new way of thinking, which yields to a new way of, of living. And many times throughout the scriptures, the same Apostle Paul is writing to Christians about their mind and how they think and what they should meditate on, what they should ponder. It, it's, uh, some people call it the battlefield of the mind. And Jesus changes how you think. He gives you a brand new perspective, a brand new worldview. And as often as explained, a worldview is, is the filter, the, the way you view life and the way you understand things. And there's lots of different worldviews out there, but Jesus changes your worldview. He gives you a different way to think. This same man who wrote this, Paul, wrote a letter to the ancient church at Rome. It's in your Bible called the Book of Romans. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, it's important to be baptized if you've never been baptized as a believer. It's important to find a Bible study group if you don't have a Bible study group. It's important to find a local church to be a part of, yes. But notice how the Scripture says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Sometimes we'll do all those other things, and we won't allow the Lord to be renewing and changing our minds. Do not be conformed to this world, but experience the transforming power of Jesus by the renewing of your mind, it says. 
That's what the scripture is teaching us. Uh, giving us a, a brand new way to think. Also, when Paul wrote the first letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Then he says, But we have the mind of Christ. When he talks about the natural man, that means a non-believer, somebody that doesn't believe the claims of Jesus, hasn't surrendered. They're still living in a a natural, unbelieving state. The natural man, the the unbelieving roommate you have, or friend that you have, the family member you have, the, the natural man does not understand the things of God. And maybe you have people like that in your life. You've tried to explain the gospel to them. You've tried to explain your belief. They just don't get it. You know why? Because as unbelievers, they don't understand the things of God because those things are spiritually discerned. And the Bible says they they can't even know them unless God's spirit moves within them. But it says you're not like that. Those are the unbelieving so-called natural people of the world. You are followers of Jesus. And that last phrase he uses in verse 16, it says, you have the mind of Christ. You don't think like the world. You're to think like Christ. You're to have a worldview that Jesus changes not only who you are and changes what you live for, but he changes how you think. You have the mind of Christ. I remember coming up years ago, the... The WWJD was a big thing. What would Jesus do? It was on the wristbands and we had car stickers and, and all that's great. But perhaps a better thing would be to say WWJT. What would Jesus think? Next time you encountered a dilemma or decision or circumstance, what would Jesus think about this? Because you have the mind of Christ. As followers of Jesus, we are called to think like Jesus. To have a worldview like Jesus, the mind of Christ. So, how do you do that? Because you might be sitting here this morning or you're watching through our live stream still, and and you wonder, I don't think I have the mind of Christ because I struggle with greed and uh, jealousy and lust and anger and bitterness. That doesn't seem like the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ, you just have to learn how to use it. You have to develop that habit and discipline of thinking with the mind of Christ, not with the world, not with your emotions, thinking biblically. Two of the ways you can do that to develop the mind of Christ, one is to fill your mind with the scriptures, Bible intake. You simply will not and cannot think biblically if you haven't been consuming the Bible. You've got to have Bible intake. So one side of the coin is fill your mind with the Scriptures. The other side of the coin is to filter your mind through the Scriptures. And once you have filled your mind, it's like breathing in and breathing out. Once you have filled your mind, then you can filter your mind. You start thinking biblically. You have Bible intake. And then the Bible gives you a reference and a filter as well. A simple illustration is if you had two arms of a scale, and on one side you put all your Bible intake, and the other side put all your media intake, which side would it tip toward? Now most of us, let's be honest, most of us consume a whole lot more media than we do the Scriptures. And so let me challenge you. I, you know, I, I, I'm not here to, to beat you up. I, I'm here to, to help you to, 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 to find peace and strength, and not to tear you down, but to build you up, as I say. But one of the best things you can do if you want to deepen your faith and walk with Jesus is find some kind of way to have more Bible intake into your life. Sunday morning is great to be here and read the Bible and sing. But let me encourage you. There's lots of Bible reading plans out here. Find some way you can start reading and and receiving the Scriptures. Uh, Even it's just a couple verses a day, a few minutes a day, that regular Bible intake. That's the single most important thing you can do to help you start thinking biblically. And once you fill your mind with the Scriptures, then you filter them through the Scriptures. What does the filter do? Sometimes the filter keeps things out. If you think biblically, you can start filtering out greed and lust and pride and anger and bitterness. It helps you. It's not a, it's not a magic pill, but it helps you be better able to filter out those kind of things in your mind. 
but also a filter changes the way things appear. How many times have you put a filter on a photograph? You had a dark photograph and you put a filter on it, changed the way it looked. Well, when you filter things to the scriptures, it changes the perspective entirely. So thinking biblically with the mind of Christ involves the scriptures breathing in and breathing out, filling them and filtering with them. Uh, in 2012, Ravi Zacharias was interviewed by the Christian Post and he made this great statement. He said, he said, basically the problem is we're living in a world which listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings. We aren't thinking biblically, he says. We're not using the mind of Christ. We, we are listening with our eyes and we're thinking with our feelings. And you see that because if, if people can touch people's feelings the most, that's how they respond, not rationally, not biblically. They're just responding emotionally. And indeed, we live in a world that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings. But we have the mind of Christ. We are not called to listen with our eyes. We are not called to think with our feelings. We are called to think biblically. Not everything in life is rules and regulations, right and wrong, black and white. It's okay to admit as people of faith, there's some gray areas out there. Some things are a wisdom issue, not necessarily a sin issue. You make a choice based on wisdom, not because it's a black and white sin. In the gray areas of life, how do you think biblically? Let me share with you three living laboratories where you can learn how to think with the mind of Christ, think biblically. And these aren't perfect sciences. I, I had lab coming through college and believe me, <laughs> it wasn't perfect. It's a good thing we didn't blow the place up in other words. But living laboratory where you just learn how to do this, how to think biblically. One living laboratory where you learn how to think biblically is in political issues. They're around us every day. When a, when a political issue comes before us, our first devotion is neither to the Democrats nor the Republicans. How can you as a follower of Jesus think biblically about that certain political issue? For example, did you know the United States of America, we have $32 trillion in debt. You thought your credit card was high. We have $32 trillion in debt. What should you think about that? I don't care what the Democrat or Republicans think about. As followers of Jesus, we live in a nation with representative government that over the years has amassed $32 trillion in debt. How do you think biblically about that? Another example of the southern border. We see that on the news every day. Are they families and children coming across needing asylum? Are they really drug cartel members coming across? Who do you believe? How do you respond? Should we have refugee shelters? Should we bust them all over the nation? The Democrats got their idea. The Republicans got their idea. But as followers of Jesus, how do you think biblically about all the immigration and refuge and people coming over the southern border? With the mind of Christ, thinking biblically. And then it comes down to when you choose candidates to vote for whether it's a candidate for the city council or the county commissioners, maybe in the state legislature or the governor's house or even in the White House. Next year, there's a, I, I hear told that there's a presidential election. When you go to choose which candidate you'll support, how do you think biblically with the mind of Christ? Because you think biblically, sometimes there's certain policies you cannot support as you think biblically about it. And sometimes there's certain personalities you cannot support as you think biblically. So we're called not to swear our allegiance to political parties, but to the mind of Christ. Whatever the issue might be, how do you think biblically and then make a decision accordingly? That's a living laboratory where you kind of stretch your muscles and learn how to use the mind of Christ. A second living laboratory, in case I'm not in the deep enough water yet, I'm about to go a little deeper. <laughs> the cultural social issues of the day. My oh my, aren't they everywhere? So when some cultural social issue comes, how do you think biblically about it? Take abortion. Thinking biblically about abortion, 
Is that a genuine, is, is that a needed health care process? Is it not? As you think about it biblically. Is that unborn child a real person or not? How do you think biblically about that? Should abortions be uh, legal, but we work to keep them safe and rare, or should they be illegal top to bottom? How do you think biblically about that issue? Don't think emotionally. Don't listen with your eyes and think with your feelings. Have the mind of Christ. How do you think biblically about a cultural social issue such as that? Another one is the um, idea of uh, LGBTQ plus movement and transgenderism. And that's even more complicated because inevitably you have a family member who is uh, identified with the LGBTQ uh, lifestyle, or maybe you have a, somebody you know in your, in your friendships or your family relationships who's a transgendered man or transgendered woman or is talking about it. And, we, and you love those folks. And what happens when you love people, you, you begin to listen with your eyes and think with your feelings. How, how do you think biblically when one of your dear friends, when, you, when your son is living a gay lifestyle, how do you think biblically about that? You, you love him, certainly. You may have a roommate, somebody in college with you, somebody, a family member. When it comes to those issues, how does the mind of Christ help you think about it appropriately? I love the way Alistair Begg put it in recent days. He said, it, it, it's a lie. It's a lie of the devil, a lie of the world to say there's only two choices. <laughs> that you either affirm the person or hate the person. Don't buy into that lie. Because when you think biblically, aren't there more choices than just either loving somebody or affirming somebody? When you use the mind of Christ, you don't get caught in that false dichotomy. You know that there's not just two choices. You're not going to take the bait on that. Those aren't the only two choices. The mind of Christ gives you more choices. So how do you think about Then you throw in racial issues, racism issues. How do you approach people of different racial backgrounds and, ra and, and racial identities? Think biblically about that. Then you throw in issues about poverty. Did you know in Bullock County, Georgia, 21% of our friends and neighbors and coworkers live in poverty? I'm not talking about Miami. I'm not talking about New York. I'm not talking about Atlanta, Georgia. But 21% of our neighbors that live right here in Bullock County live in poverty. How do you think biblically with the mind of Christ that one out of every five people you see lives in poverty right here in our own community? Thinking it's a living laboratory, all these cultural social issues. Don't listen with your eyes and think with your feelings. Think with the mind of Christ. Think biblically. And a third living laboratory is relational issues who I should date, who I should marry. Should I stay married? You know, you might say I'm unhappy, I don't like my husband, he doesn't like me, and, and so think biblically about why you're married, who you should date, who are your friends. Should you stay married even though you're unhappy, or if you're unhappy, is that reason to get divorced? Think biblically about that. Should you date anybody because dating really doesn't lead to anything? Or should you date only people that share your faith in Jesus Christ? Think biblically about relationships and marriages and such. So Jesus changes the way we think. Now sometimes we don't use the mind of Christ, but you have it. And if you will fill your mind with the scriptures and filter back through the scriptures, when you find yourself in one of these living laboratories, you'll be able to think biblically and call upon the mind of Christ. And if Jesus changes anything, he changes everything. And one of the things he changes, he changes the way we think. And then the next change is he changes the way I live. Not only how I think, he changes how I live. Because a new way of thinking always yields a new way of living. Because you can't change the way you live until you change the way you think. That's why Paul, the this, this same writer here, wrote to the Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you're transformed by your thinking, it helps you not be conformed to the things of this world. He gives you a new way of thinking, 
and a new way of living. That's why the brother of Jesus, James, in the book of James, said be, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. You've heard the truth, you've heard the scriptures, you know the scriptures, now go out there and, and live the scriptures. He's trying to, why would, you choose, why would you choose an incongruent life where you know the scriptures but you don't live the scriptures? He says be doers of the word, not just hearers only. It was a um, Oswald, Champ, uh, Oswald um, Chambers who wrote the great book, My Utmost for His Highest. He said, the best measure of a spiritual life is not its ecstasies, but its obedience. Meaning in my life and in your life, the best measure of vibrancy and a walk with Jesus is not some super sensational moment of ecstasy where you just ride and high on emotion and, and spiritual f fulfillment. It's rather, are you, are you walking with Jesus day by day by day? The measure of your spiritual life is not the ecstasies, but in the obedience. As one preacher said, it's not how high you jump, but how straight you walk once you hit the ground. Jesus changes how I think and how I live. Let me finish my sermon with a simple teaching model that I developed years ago. I've shared before, but if you're new here at First Baptist Church States, it'll be new to you. Sometimes we, obedience is disguised as, a, uh, disobedience is disguised as obedience. I've seen it happen in three ways, where people fall prey to disguised obedience. They, they think they're obeying the Lord, but they're really not. The first example is, Partial obedience is really just disobedience. But we, but we think we're obeying the Lord <laughs> because it's partial obedience. And we know he's told us to do, do this number of things, and maybe we've done some of them. And boy, we're glad about that, aren't we? We're proud of ourselves, and we tell people. We, we, but we know God has let us do all these thing, things, and we've only done some of them, but we're mighty glad, you know, God, you ought to be happy. I've done part of what you called me to do. And somehow we, we deceive ourselves in thinking that partial obedience is enough, but really partial obedience. If you haven't done all of what God's called you to do, your partial obedience is really just a disguise for disobedience. A second disguise is delayed obedience. And maybe you know God's called you to do something. Maybe it's to seek forgiveness, maybe it's to change uh, behavior, maybe it's a decision about your major or somebody you're dating. Maybe you know God's called you to do something and, and you've agreed, yes Lord, I know you're leading me to do this thing. But you just hadn't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> You know, maybe in the start of the new year, maybe after this semester is over, or maybe once the kids get out of the house, or once you finally get that issue solved at, at the workplace, or, or once your schedule kind of slows down, that you, you, you plan to do it. Yes, Lord, I, I know what you want me to do. Yes, Lord, I will obey, just not right now. And your delayed obedience is really just a disguise for disobedience. And the third example is substitute obedience. It's just disobedience. If God's called you to do something, but you didn't want to, you didn't do that, but you're doing something else, that substitute obedience is disobedience. You saw in the video this morning, one of our college students, Grace Kennedy, she's seated here in the second row. Either you love Jesus or came late to sit on the second row. <laughs> and that she was struck. So she went to France this summer working with our Southern Baptist missions work over there, got way out of her comfort zone. But she could have done all these other things for the Lord during the summer. But if she had substituted something else, that substitute obedience would have been disobedience. So what is it in your life? In what way have you fallen prey to disguised obedience? God's called you to do something, change something, become something, but you've fallen prey to one of these other forms of so-called obedience. And remember, as we wrap it up, 
If Jesus changes anything, he changes everything. That's dangerous. Don't follow Jesus unless you mean it. Because he wants everything from you. He wants everything you are, everything you have. It starts with saving faith where you yield to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then every day you continue to yield to him over and over and over again. In what way do you need to respond to the truth of the scriptures that you have heard today? I know I've been here long enough to know that you, you didn't come to hear John Waters speak. <laughs> but I trust the Holy Spirit has used God's word to stir and teach and do something in your life. So how will you respond today? How is Jesus changing the way you think? Or how does he need to change the way you think? How is he changing the way you live? We're going to sing a final song this morning. And there's several ways I invite you to respond before we finish this service. One way is during the final song to walk forward to one of the staff members who will be standing down front here. You might want to walk forward and say, I want to acknowledge publicly that I'm yielding to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never done that before. And this is a perfect time. We invite you to walk forward. Or maybe you want to walk forward to one of these staff ministers and have a prayer about something in your life, some change that Jesus is calling you to make. And you can pray with one of them. Or like in the first service, had some folks come and just kneel by themselves or stand by themselves. That's one way to respond. A second way to respond today is stop by the Next Steps area. Even if it's something as simple as the Wednesday night Bible studies. Maybe you know that's something you need to be a part of. You want to find maybe a, a discipleship group or a Bible study and, and that's a missing part of your life. Well, stop by the Next Steps area. This Wednesday we're starting a, a men's study, a women's study, and two co-ed studies. And maybe for you, your form of obedience is just stop by next steps and pick up some information and make a decision. Or maybe there's other thing. Another way to respond is I'd love to sit down with you. You can, you can call me, contact me. I think we have my uh, cell number and my email address. That's my personal cell phone number, 912-536-5886. Come straight to me. If I can't answer it, my voicemail box is not full. Some of y'all need to learn how to empty some of those messages, get that, that voicemail box empty. Or send me a text. And if I don't recognize the number, I might say, tell me who this is. It helps if you say, hey, this is so-and-so. Nobody filters my email, come straight to me. That's my personal cell number. Maybe you want to text me or call me and say, I'd like to sit down and talk about this. Maybe, maybe walking forward is not your thing today. I, I get it but there's something on your heart. That's God's spirit. If there's something on your heart today, that's God's spirit stirring. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to tamp it down? Or are you going to take that next step? So as we sing this final song, I pray you will determine what your next step is and you'll respond as God's spirit has led you. Let me lead us in prayer and then we'll stand and sing. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit through your word continues to stir in each of our hearts and that we're allowing Jesus to change us from the inside out and we'll walk with Jesus every day and allow him to move and work and change us as we do so. And may we determine during this final song right now to do all that you've called us to do. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our online broadcast of our worship services. We would love to have the opportunity to connect with you. And you can do that by visiting our online connect card on our website or scanning the QR code that you see on the screen. If you live in Statesboro, or Bullock County or surrounding areas, we would love to have the opportunity to meet you in person and to have you join us for our worship service on Sunday. We have services at 8.30 a.m. or 11 o'clock a.m. Until next time, have a great day. God bless.